there's this new piece in Axios, and we're going to spend a little time on it because, frankly, I think it's one of the better pieces that I've read in a while. And I want to give it its, its just time. I, I want to do, do it justice. So it's a piece out of The Atlantic, and it's written by a guy named uh, Yascha Monk, who, by the way, self-proclaimed liberal activist. This guy is, is clearly on the left. He leans left. He even talks about that in this piece. I don't think we'll read that part of it. But um, this is not somebody that is on the right. He's not a conservative in any way. But he goes over a study that talks about the danger of full-on embracing this PC culture, the identity politics. And I, I got to say, it's one of the most thoughtful pieces that I've read in a while from any publication, including some of the more conservative ones. And I just really think that there's a lot to be said about this because it confirms a lot of what conservatives have been saying about the PC culture for a while now and also cautions liberals in some of their assumptions about what is politically correct, things like hate speech, that sort of thing, that uh, it seems as though we're not nearly as divided as you would think. Now, I think that there's actually incredible division in the country, but there's not division on this issue. The vast majority of Americans do not like the PC culture. They don't like this uh, social justice warrior Olympics, as it's been called, where there's a constant sort of competition to try to rack up as many labels. And if you don't say the right thing or call somebody by the wrong pronoun or use the wrong word, it's because you're a hate monger. The average American just does not like this. And it actually confirms some of the things that, that I and other conservatives have been saying for years about the PC culture and some of the pitfalls of it. So we'll go ahead and jump right into this. If you look at what Americans have to say on issues such as immigration, the extent of white privilege, and the prevalence of sexual harassment, the authors argue seven distinct cultures uh, clusters emerge. Progressive activists, traditional liberals, passive liberals, the politically disengaged, moderates, traditional conservatives, and devoted conservatives. Now, out of that, I'm guessing I probably fall into the devoted conservatives category, I would, I would suppose. According to the report, 25% of Americans are traditional or devoted conservatives, and their views are far outside the American mainstream. Some 8% of Americans are progressive activists. So that's really interesting that 25% fall into one of the two conservative categories, but only 8% fall into the progressive activist. And their views are even less typical. By contrast, the two-thirds of Americans who don't belong to either extreme constitute an exhausted majority. Their members share a sense of fatigue with our polarized national conversation, a willingness to be flexible in their political viewpoints, and a lack of a voice in the national conversation. That's important too, and we may come back to this in a second. But feeling like there's a lack of voice there, I said back when it happened, even though I was still stunned in disbelief, is that one thing that Donald Trump did very well, and I think it's the reason that he actually won the last election, is there were so many people out there that felt like nobody is paying attention to me, nobody is listening to me, and Donald Trump kind of sounded like that guy in the bar that talks about politics just like everybody else does and kind of shoots his mouth off a little bit and isn't real precise in his language. But he sounded like a lot of the people that wound up voting for him, and I think that that was a huge political advantage for him. They continue on. Most members of the exhausted majority, and then some, dislike political correctness. Among the general population, a full 80% believe that, quote, political correctness is a problem in our country, unquote. Even young people are uncomfortable with it, including 74% ages 24 to 29 and 79% under age 24. On this particular issue, the woke are in the clear minority across all ages. Youth isn't a good proxy for support of political correctness, and it turns out race isn't either. So one of the things that this really points out is there are not that many people that follow politics closely. 
And it's very difficult for you in your own political bubble. We, we all know about the bubble. We talk about the bubble, how on your social media or you surround yourself with people that politically align with you and you never hear ideas outside of that bubble. And so you tend to think that your ideas are more popular than they really are. Well, larger than that smaller political bubble of right and left, there's a larger bubble that just encompasses people that are interested in politics. And I got to tell you, the truth is, it's not that many. I mean, I would love for people to be more engaged. I would love for people to be more informed on the issues. But the truth is, it's just not there. When you look at the ratings of talk, sh talk shows and talk radio and news in general, and I'm not talking about right or left. I'm talking about the whole shebang, uh, MSNBC and Fox, CNN and The Blaze, all of it. There's just not that many people that are engaged. You look at how it does compared to music shows, compared to reality TV, all of those other things, and it's not even close. And so if you are interested in politics at all, regardless of what side you're on, you're already in a niche audience. And this really kind of points that out. But one thing that's important to note about this, about their findings, something that actually did kind of surprise me at least a little bit is that the like of political correctness actually kind of did a reversal of what I actually thought it was going to do. Because listen to this, 74% ages 24 to 29 and 79% under 24. And that's the percentage of people that were uncomfortable with PC culture. Did you notice what happened? It actually went up five percentage points the younger you got. And so the assumption by a lot of people including myself, is that the PC culture is mostly propagated by and supported by young people. But what this study just showed is that may be true and there may be sort of a, a bell curve and a bubble in the people around my age, people close to 30. But actually, the further down you go, the younger you get, the more the distrust of PC culture actually ratchets up. And that to me is just fascinating. Because I think what it does show and, and what it sort of highlights is that really it's not just the young people. In fact, it's not even primarily the young people. And so it really does sort of break down some of those misconceptions that we may have had. And it's just a small sliver of the population as a whole that even pays attention to politics and an incredibly, incredibly small sliver of that small sliver that actually supports political correctness. And so we're going to talk about exactly what that means and why it's so prevalent if it's such a small amount of people that support it. So he talks about this a little bit later. Whites are ever so slightly less likely than average to believe that political correctness is a problem in this country. 79% of them share this sentiment. Instead, it is Asians, 82%, Hispanics, 87%, and American Indians, 88%, who are most likely to oppose political correctness. As one 40-year-old American Indian in Oklahoma said in his focus group, according to the report, quote, it seems like every day you wake up and something has changed. Do you say Jew or Jewish? Is it a black guy, African American? You are so on your toes because you never know what to say. So political correctness in that sense is scary. Which, that is a 100% understandable stance for this guy to take. And based on what we're seeing in this report so far, this doesn't sound like somebody that's incredibly politically engaged, probably doesn't watch the news all that often, but he's looking at the people around him and saying, I feel like I have to walk on eggshells around everybody now. And that's the part of PC culture that people really don't like. He continues on. The one part of the standard narrative that the data primarily affirm is that African Americans are most likely to support political correctness, but the difference between them and the other groups is much smaller than generally supposed. Three quarters of African Americans oppose political correctness. This means that they are only four percentage points less likely than whites and only five percentage points less likely than average to believe that political correctness is a problem. See, now I find this incredibly fascinating because 
even though there is a high level of dislike of PC culture across the board, the average is 80, what it also shows is who are the two groups that are most likely to support it if you break it down by race? Black people and white people. Now, why is that? I want you to really put on your thinking cap and, and ponder this. Why would those two groups, out of all the groups, why would those two groups specifically be more likely to support the politically correct culture than anybody else? See, I contend that it's because they're far less likely to be immigrants. The reason that you have a high level, and granted, they're, like I said, they're high across the board, so there's not a ton of differentiation between these, these breakdowns racially. But the fact that the support of politically correct culture is highest amongst black people and whites is that they are far less likely to be immigrants. And the reason that that's important is because not every Asian or every Hispanic is an immigrant. Obviously, that's true. But they're at least more likely to have relatives that were immigrants. And so they're not far connected from somebody that lived in a place that was not America. And this being a free speech issue, I think that part of the reason for that is that they are more likely to know what it's actually like when a government starts deciding what you can and cannot say. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I don't have the numbers to back that up. It's speculation. I admit it's speculation, but it makes sense. That of all the groups that are most opposed to it, they're the ones that are less likely to be immigrants. Now, the one outlier in that, you may remember, who is the group that is most likely to oppose political correctness? American Indians. So how does that explain them? It does throw a monkey wrench into my theory. I fully admit that. Maybe because they're also skeptical of big government. And I think it's interesting that the people that would be the beneficiaries and I've said a million times on this program that I don't think it actually benefits them at all, doesn't help them at all to be politically correct. But the people that are at least perceived as the beneficiaries of the PC culture, they're the ones that are saying, no, not really interested in it. I actually fear it a lot more than I think it helps. I find that really fascinating. The, uh, the black community seems to be the only outlier in that, but I do think that there may be something to the reason that some of the other minority groups, Asians and Hispanics specifically, have decided that they're more scared of people controlling speech than they are of some somebody saying a word that they find offensive, is because they probably lived in or have, ha have had relatives that live in a place where that is a reality, where the government actually does say, "Nope, you're not allowed to say these things." I think that that may, if nothing else, just be a contributing factor. If age and race do not predict support for political correctness, what does? Income and education. While 83% of respondents who make less than 50000 dislike political correctness, just 70% of those that make more than 100000 are skeptical about it. And while 87% who have not attended college think that political correctness has grown to be a problem, only 66% of those with postgraduate degrees share that sentiment. Now, this is something that has reaffirmed. This part didn't surprise me at all. This is something that just reaffirmed something that I've been saying from the very beginning. They always try to paint the person that is afraid of political correctness as someone that is privileged. In other words, somebody that is a white cisgender male who probably makes a lot of money, uh, owns a company, all this stuff, basically sort of the monopoly man caricature of what a conservative is. And it's only conservatives and it's only people that are racist and wouldn't spit on a minority person if their hair was on fire. That's that's the image that the left is often often projected of the people that are afraid of PC culture. 
Now, the study shows that that's not true, but what's fascinating to me is that the people that are most likely, the indicator that they're saying that is most likely to determine whether or not a person is in favor of PC culture or not, is not race. It's not sex. It's whether or not you are educated and whether or not you are rich. And typically, the richer you are, the more likely you are to support it. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to support it. I've been saying this for a very long time. PC culture is primarily supported, primarily pushed, by rich, pompous, overeducated, angry white liberals. Not saying there aren't other people that push it. Obviously there are. But primarily, if you're talking about overall numbers, the people that actually push the PC culture, the, the, the largest chunk of the social justice warrior army are overeducated, pompous, rich, white liberals. Now, nothing wrong in the world with being rich, nothing wrong in the world with being white, but it smashes that narrative into pieces that if you're white and you're rich, then you oppose the PC culture because you're scared that it's going to take away your privilege. Truth is, it's the exact opposite. Most of the people pushing it would not even be the beneficiaries of the system being overturned. And another thing, too, is it 100% explains why this perception is out there. Because think about it. Where is there a group of primarily white people that are very rich and way overeducated. As my dad would say, they were educated beyond their common sense. Where would a, such a group of people be? Well, they would be primarily on the coast, in California and New England. And a lot of those people would be journalists and media types. So you see, here's what's going on. That particular subset of the culture, they believe that they have the ear of the people, the voice of the people, that this is what the people want, when the numbers say it's the exact opposite. In fact, it's huge in the opposite direction of people that don't like PC culture. But because they live in their little bubble, they live in their ivory tower with a bunch of other angry, white, overeducated liberals, they believe that they are doing the right thing and they have people spurring them on. They never leave their little safe space. And because of that, and because they never hear ideas from the other side, they believe that they are doing the right thing, that they are somehow helping a minority person living out in Kansas somewhere, or in Alabama, by pushing their PC culture garbage even though the very people that they believe that they are championing, that they are helping out, they don't want what they're selling. And so I do think that it's remarkable that, as I've been saying for years, the primary proponent of the PC culture, the vast majority of social justice warriors, are people that have all kinds of advanced degrees, that are very wealthy, usually white, in other words, the people that they would claim are privileged, it's those very people that are actually the ones pushing the PC culture, not the minorities, because I think the vast majority of minority people have enough common sense. And I've spoken to them. I, I live here in the city of Montgomery where I'm actually the minority. The average person walking around on the street looks at it and says, I want no part of it and are wise to do so. Because even if they're not very politically engaged, they're looking at that and saying, we don't need to be prosecuting people or bringing the hammer down on somebody because he accidentally used the wrong word to describe a gay person. We don't need to be prosecuting people because they say in public, you know, I really don't want a 30-year-old dude using the bathroom right next to my 9-year-old girl. They have enough common sense to see that. It's the people in the media and the people in Hollywood that don't. So, he continues on. Political tribe, as defined by the authors, 
is an even better predictor of views on political correctness. Okay, that should surprise no one. Among devoted conservatives, 97% of political uh, believe political correctness is a problem. Among traditional liberals, 61% do. Progressive activists are the only group that strongly backs political correctness. Only 30% see that as a problem. Again, it's a tiny sliver of a tiny sliver of society that believes this. So what does that group look like? Compared to the rest of the nationally representative polling sample, progressive activists are much more likely to be rich, highly educated, and white. Confirms what I just said. They are nearly twice as likely as the average to make more than $100,000 a year. They are nearly three times as likely to have a postgraduate degree, and while 12% of the overall sample in the study is African American, only 3% of progressive activists are. With the exception of the small tribe of devoted conservatives, progressive activists are the most racially homogenous group in the country. So in other words, and I do find that pretty interesting as well, what you're seeing is that out of these groups, the dedicated conservatives and the progressive liberals are the two groups that are the most homogenous. In other words, the ones that are the most white. I do find that pretty interesting that of the other races, you're much more likely to find a bunch of moderates. I don't know. I just found that fascinating. Anyway, he, he goes on. There is, however, plenty of additional support for the idea that social views of most Americans are not nearly as neatly divided by age or race as commonly believed. According to the Pew Research Center, for example, only 26% of black Americans consider themselves liberal. And the more common study, nearly half of Latinos argued that many people nowadays are too sensitive to how Muslims are treated, while two in five African Americans agreed, quote, immigration nowadays is bad for America. Look, I really think that all that goes down to is that the truth of the matter is, when you boil it all down to its bare bones, when you get it down to just the, the basics of the PC culture, even the people that would be the beneficiaries of it, they don't want to play the, the PC hierarchy thing that everybody is, is trying to do. That, that you have to treat um, black people this way, Hispanic people this way, uh, Native Americans this way, and then if they're black and they're uh, a lesbian, then there's a whole other set of rules. And if they're black and lesbian and a tranny and also have rickets, like there's a whole other thing there. And if they're disabled, then you've got a whole... Nobody likes this playing the the label game where you're trying to stack up as many as possible and that gives you more right to be offended by something that somebody says. Nobody looks at that and says, oh yeah, that's the world I want to live in. Unless you happen to be one of the dedicated progressive activists, like they said, that happen to be mostly really rich and mostly really white. <laughs> Those seem to be the only people that look at that world and go, yep, want a part of that. And so it's an important distinction. So I'll just kind of wrap this up here because I think that this is the, uh, the really, it brings the whole piece together. So the fact that we are so widely off the mark in our perception of how most people feel about political correctness should probably also make us rethink some of our other basic assumptions about the country. It is obvious that certain elements on the right mock instances which political correctness goes awry in order to win the license to spew out ra racial hatred. Eh, there's a small element of that. It's a minority, but yeah, it's there. And it is understandable that, in the eyes of some progressives, this makes anybody that dares criticize political correctness a witting tool or a useful idiot for the right. But that's not fair to the Americans who feel deeply alienated by the woke culture. Indeed, while 80% of Americans believe that political correctness has become a problem in the country, even more, 82% believe that hate speech is also a problem. It turns out that white progressive activists tend to think that only hate speech is a problem, and devoted conservatives tend to think that only political correctness is a problem. A clear majority of all Americans holds a more nuanced point of view. They abhor racism, but they don't think that 
but they don't think that the way we now practice political correctness represents a promising way to overcome racial injustice. Finally, somebody on the left gets it. Full credit to the guy who wrote this. Somebody on the left finally figured it out. And maybe there are others that just don't have a very loud voice or don't have a platform, and so I haven't seen them. So there are people on the left that have, have really narrowed in on this. But finally, somebody from a major publication on the left looked at the data and said, you know what, all of our preconceived notions about political correctness seem to be pretty much way off the mark. Somebody finally got it. And somebody also had the good sense to look at that data and to observe it and to consider it carefully and say, you know what this means? That on the left, we tend to assume that anybody that is in any way critical of the hypersensitive PC culture is automatically a racist. Are there people that use their hatred of the PC culture for racism? Absolutely. You've got the alt-right. You've got Milo Yasofafanopoulos. You've got uh, Richard Spencer. You've got, to a certain degree, Alex Jones. I don't know necessarily that Alex Jones is a racist, but he kind of falls into that, that more alt-right category. I'm not going to discuss the nuance of that right now because it's not the time. But my point is, there is a small fringe group of people that actually, yes, do, do, they do that. They use their hatred of globalism and their hatred of the PC culture, both things that I don't like either, to justify just spewing nonsense or worse, spewing actual racist hatred. But it is wrong to assume that because a handful of people do that, that everybody that is critical of that is automatically a racist, is automatically a hate monger, is automatically some kind of authoritarian fascist. Just because two people happen to oppose the same idea does not mean that they are in the same boat or are doing so for the same reasons. Perfect example. If you have a libertarian person that is opposing a particular spending bill, you can't just assume that it's for the same reason that a Democrat is opposing the exact same spending bill. The Democrat may be opposing it because... They think that it spends too much on the military and not enough on the welfare state. The libertarian is doing so maybe because he thinks, okay, well, it should include at least a few military cuts, maybe not cut the whole thing, but at least cut part of it, and we should be spending zero money on the welfare state. You see there? Two completely different political ideologies, two completely different motivations for supporting whatever policy that they support, and yet they find themselves on the same side of the fight in this one particular instance. And that's what's going on here. But for so many on the left, they look at anybody that opposes PC culture, that opposes uh, literally throwing people in jail for saying things that might be unpopular and say, well, the only reason, the only possible reason that they can oppose that is because they hate black people, they hate brown people, they hate Asian people. But what this data shows and what this guy, you know, full credit to, to this guy, Monk, um, Monk or Monk, I'm not sure how, how exactly you pronounce it, but the guy that wrote this article for finally looking at it and saying, you know what, that's completely unfair. Some people do it, sure. But that does not mean the vast, overwhelming majority of Americans that don't like PC culture are doing so because they're racist. Most people abhor racism, still don't want what the PC culture is peddling. Still don't look at that and say, nope, don't want to play that game. That doesn't align with my worldview. Like he said in this article, there's an awful lot of um, Hispanic people that are saying, yeah, it's a big problem with the way that everybody has to walk on eggshells around Muslims. And frankly, we're a little scared of their ideology. Doesn't mean they hate every person that's Muslim. Doesn't mean they hate every person that's Arab. Doesn't even mean they hate the people that they're critical of. And so I really do think that this is a massive step forward. And, you know, it wasn't something that I saw being talked about a lot in the mainstream media. So unfortunately, I think a lot of this is going to fall on deaf ears. But hopefully, this is the tip of the iceberg. And what we're going to see now on both sides, not just the left, 
hopefully because this guy is from the left, that it'll have an effect on them specifically. But I hope that what this does is it, it opens the eyes of a lot of people on both sides and says, you know, we're really not nearly as different as we think. And maybe it's time that we start seriously reevaluating some of the things that we've done, because I got to tell you right now, What's going on in the Democrat primary, if you watch that debate, it is nothing but political pandering primarily to the social justice warriors. And since social justice warriors tend to be very active, very politically involved, they're the people that are more likely to be your volunteers, they're the people that are more likely to talk about you online, to be a booster, then that, of course, is a group that you want to curry. I understand that. But the Democrats better watch out because if they are making their entire platform, okay, how can I pander to this specific group? Based on what we're seeing in this, based on what we're seeing in this study, that is a losing strategy. Because people do not want the PC police. And I think that a big, big part of the reason that Donald Trump won, goodness knows I've had my disagreements with the man both in principle and in policy. But one thing he's phenomenal at is calling out the crap of the social justice warriors. Excellent at that. And if the Democrat makes wants to make that their primary thing, things like reparations for blacks and, and in Elizabeth Warren's case, even gays, they are going to lose and they are going to lose in spectacular fashion if they make that the only issue that they want to talk about. Because the numbers show that the vast, overwhelming majority of Americans do not want to buy the product that they're selling. Hey, y'all know I'm a stats and numbers guy, so here's some fun facts for you. People that subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel are 200% more satisfied with their online video content and 400% more likely to be able to speak intelligently about politics and religion with somebody they know. Also, Four out of five people that subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel live healthier, more fulfilling lives. And that fifth guy was just a social justice warrior with a stick up his butt. Also, 82% of the statistics on the internet, totally made up.